If it's distracting audio, like I'm gonna click off that quicker than like, all right, the video is a little choppy. That's okay. Like as long as I can listen to it and get the value from it. So I 100% agree with yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's such a great kickoff point mm -hmm. for this podcast. We didn't even do an introduction. Guys, uh, welcome Nick Terrio <laughs> and super stoked that he's here today. Uh, he's visiting from Nashville, did a last minute fill in. So dude, thank you so much for, welcome, for filling in. And, and uh, we had another guy that was coming on the podcast. He had to cancel last second. So it was like perfect timing. I put the story up and I was like, all right. I'm not going to accept anyone on just to see who comes through. And then you message me and I was like, it's got to be Nick because like, well, he doesn't come around very often. It, yeah, it, it was like perfect, too, because like I was already coming here for family. You no, know, it's my mom's birthday yesterday. So we're coming here specifically just for family time. Yep. And I knew I wanted to see you and I know we couldn't like really make things work because of like our tight schedules. And yep. then you put that. I'm like, bro, that's perfect. It's we perfect. can have our catch up and as well as we can also like work. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's perfect, man. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm excited, man, because like mm -hmm. the it's such a perfect kickoff point talking about like podcasting, talking about microphones, because dude, like you have been really just all in on YouTube for th four, five years now. Four, well, four years now, four uh -huh. years uh, specifically for ecom and everything like that. But bro, I mean, I've been on YouTube since you know I was 12 years old, and I'm 27 years old right now. Yeah. So I've been doing YouTube game for a long time, yeah. but uh, specifically around e-com and Facebook ads. Yeah. About four yeah. years now. Yeah. That's awesome. And if you guys don't know, Nick, he's in the e-commerce niche, runs an agency, mm -hmm. very successful agency. He's been building it. How long have you been building the agency for? Uh, since 2019, that's when I went all in yeah. on the agency. Uh, but prior to that, uh, I think my first client was like in 2017. Mm -hmm. And when did you start making e-commerce content on YouTube? So it happened by an accident. Uh, in 2019, um, you know, I was, I was just kind of, you know, messing around, watching videos on YouTube and everything about like YouTube or Facebook ads and everything like that. And again, I've been making YouTube videos since I was, you know, 12 years old and mm -hmm. I used to make Call of Duty videos. <laughs> I made Call of Duty videos from like 12 years old up until I was like 18, 19 years old, um, you know, just editing people's content and showing that off and everything like that. And I had the idea one day, I was like, you know what? I made all these Call of Duty videos. They did really successful and everything. I showed people how to use these editing programs, Adobe After Effects, Adobe Premiere, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. I was like, what if I did the same thing, but for Facebook ads? Yeah. So randomly one day, I decided to film like a video and like it was showing people how to use like bid caps and stuff and like how to get like really low lead costs and everything. Yeah. And I posted on YouTube. It got like maybe 100, 200 views, nothing crazy successful or anything like mm -hmm. that. Um, Fast forward about two months later, I get this email that said, hey, just watched this video from you. Um, we're spending $30,000 a month on Facebook ads. Um, can we hop on a call ASAP? And at first I was like, this is a scam because at the <laughs> time, the most I ever spent in my life was $100 in a day. And my mental financial thermostat was wired that a hundred dollars a day was a lot of money yeah. at that time. <laughs> and they sent me that email and I was like, okay, this is a scam. I am not like responding to this. For sure. Um, but I did. And, uh, I responded to it at like 11 o'clock at night saying, yeah, sure. You know, when can we hop on a call? Like, let's do it tomorrow morning. Um, ended up hopping on a call like 10 o'clock the next day. So not even 12 hours later, we hopped on a call, uh, talked to this girl for maybe like 10, 15 minutes. Um, they're running an e-com brand, women's clothing, spending $30,000 a month on Facebook ads, could not figure out how to make it work. And at the time I was charging maybe $1,500 a month for clients. Mm -hmm. Um, I quoted her $5,000. Yeah. I just, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to throw a really high price because she's already spending $30,000 a month. And if I cannot fix her, her mess, I can at least have enough money to outsource it. Yeah. So that way, because a lot of people, they'll charge less and then they try to outsource and they can't. So I'm like, I'm going to charge a really high number. So that way, at least I can, at the most, I can outsource it to someone with like $2,500 mm -hmm. a month. And was that the point where you were like, all right, like we're going all in on YouTube? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, that, that point actually didn't come about a year later. Um, but I did make a few more videos around it. Um, but long story short, I closed that person on that 15 minute call. I'm like, wow, that was the easiest close of my life. Got her for uh, 5K a month. And uh, she ended up being, you know, very successful client of mine for the next couple. Um, I think we think we stayed together for about two years yeah. working together. That's great. Um, but I did YouTube on and off for about a year mm -hmm. around the Facebook ads. Like I'd post a video maybe once a month, maybe two or three times a month. Um, I experimented with daily vlogging for a little period of time. Mm -hmm. I think I did it for like three months, but that really wasn't gaining any traction. Yeah. Then it was in August of 2020. I went to a mastermind, um, this 
random guy hit me up on Instagram and said, hey, uh, you know, I'm struggling with Facebook ads. Can we hop on a call? We hop on this call. We, talk, we introduce each other. We meet each other or anything like that. He shows me the ad account, give him a little bit of feedback and stuff like that. Then at the end of this call, this is what this dude does. He pulls up a slide deck and says, hey, bro, I'm like renting a yacht in Miami and everything. I got this baller ass house. He's like, would you happen to know anyone that would want to go to this mastermind? It's only $5,000. Hit him with the Uno reverse card. <laughs> so he led with, hey, I needed some Facebook ads up. And at the end of the call, he showed me all these cool things and then said, hey, do you know anyone? Yeah. I was like, yeah, why don't you just ask me? Because I'll gladly go. Yeah. Um, ended up going to this particular mastermind and... Um, with this with this guy and he, he uh i kind of told him everything that i was doing and he's like bro if you're having a lot of because my big belief at the time was that youtube is inconsistent for a client referral mm -hmm. so he's like well are you being consistent with youtube i'm mm -hmm. like no he's like well of course you're, it's gonna be inconsistent for client referrals if you're inconsistent with it in terms of like posting and, and yeah. providing content so that was my aha moment then i ended up being consistent with it every week you know, three videos a week, pretty much since August, 2020. Yeah. And that's how I've been able to scale it up. Yeah. Um, and funny enough, that person was actually Zach Hesterberg right there. That, uh, uh, that, I love that. that. <laughs> Dude, it's so funny. Cause like uh, I'm, I'm getting lunch with Zach, uh, shout out Zach Hesterberg, just yeah. a gem, Amazing guy. gem of a person. Uh, I'm getting lunch with him uh, next week. We're going to get some burritos. It's going to be fire. And you're going to get dinner with nice. him tonight, right? Uh, Saturday night. Or so Saturday, Saturday night. night okay. uh, yeah, we're going to go to that steakhouse. And then in two weeks, uh, I'll be with them in Miami. Nice. And then we're going to do the Hell's Kitchen experience in Miami oh, at dude. the uh, Jeremy Haynes Mastermind. Oh, so dude. that's going to be fun. Uh, I've yet to go to a Jeremy Haynes event. Uh, I need to get out there. You need there. to, man. Uh, I hear they're, they're legendary. He does it right. It's, you know, Jeremy's the type of guy that he's going to help you Think bigger. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I love about Jeremy. He continuously pushes you to think bigger. Mm -hmm. You may not learn anything new from an agency tactic or like new from like a client fulfillment, but he will push you and be that person that, um, you know, he, for example, he made a comment the other day about how A players love to be pushed. Mm. And that's why a lot of people in this community are A players. And yeah. he's the guy that's pushing you to make more and, and, and really challenge you. You know, um, a couple months ago, I was charging 5K from a uh, 5k month for our clients. It's like, Hey bro, why aren't you charging 10k? I'm like, I don't know. Start charging 10k and I get no no's on 10k close like five clients in a row on 10k. Didn't change anything, nothing. I just literally changed the price point. Yeah. So the German's like, dude, why the fuck are you charging 15 K? I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? You told me to charge 10 K. He's like, yeah, but bro, no one told you no at 10 K. Do you just not, not think like Clicking your brain, I'm like, oh, bro, you're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm starting to charge 15k. <laughs> uh, I love it. Yeah. No, I mean, that, what I've always kind of found with the mm -hmm. inner circle of people is like you have to have people that kind of push the boundaries of what Absolutely. one you currently know, but two, what you're comfortable actually doing. So, uh, Jeremy, uh, I've heard that same thing mm -hmm. from multiple people. So at some point, I need to get out there and just get around him because it seems like it seems like people make more money when they hang out with him. Hey, I mean, dude, I've. Uh, I mean, I, I joined Jeremy's Mastermind at like 30K a month, not even 30K a month, like 25K a month, agency revenue. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm doing multiple six figures a month now yeah. in revenue. Um, and a big part of that was because, yeah, Jeremy was constantly pushing me and, and, and challenging the belief system that mm -hmm. I had around the world and showing me more of what's possible. And I think a lot of people get stuck when they're growing the agency mm -hmm. because they think, oh, 10K a month is a lot of money. Like, yeah. you know, I come from a small town. Eight, if you're making $8,000 a month, like, you can eat anywhere you want in the town. You can pretty almost drive whatever you want besides, you know, anything, any supercars or anything like that. So, like, if you have that mindset and you're thinking that's a lot of money, you're never going to grow. Yeah. So, but once you start challenging that and realize, like, even $100,000 more profit is not a lot of money at all. Mm, yeah. And then when you start realizing that type of stuff and it's like, well, how do I get to a million? And how do I do that fast? Because yeah. I don't want to wait 20 years to get to a million dollars a month. I want to do it tomorrow. Sure. How do I do that? Yeah. yeah. So good. Um, kind of bouncing back to like YouTube, this has been a huge acquisition channel for you. And I think a lot of my viewers specifically in the agency space, they're always more focused on like the lead generation side. Mm. Um, and YouTube is normally not the thing on the radar for lead generation because it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. Um, can you kind of take us through like the growth? Cause you just crossed 30,000 subs on mm -hmm. YouTube, which congrats, by the way. That's, Thank you, man. That's freaking awesome. Um, but t take us through some of that like growth curve of you starting on YouTube. Like, When did you start to get some of the fruits of the labor uh, that you were putting into YouTube? Yeah, so um, I mean, look, my first video on Facebook ads that obviously closed my client, that 5K client, mm -hmm. first ever client for 5K. 
Um, but that took me about you know two months to get that client, mm. and I did not do it intentionally at the time. It almost kind of happened as an accident, right there, mm-hmm. right. So, but once I started taking it seriously, and as seriously as in posting three times a week, I've been posting three times a week since 2019, and you know 52 video or 52 weeks a year, you're looking at about 150 videos a year, four years. I probably post about 600 videos on the channel now, yeah, over the last four years, and a big problem a lot of people have with that is that they post a video they expect immediate results and Mm. for almost the first year you have to do it with faith that you will get clients from it and then year two and three is where you're really gonna start getting as a client and acquisition source yeah so um but for me i mean i saw with that first video then i started posting a few more videos and it wasn't long at all like i would say probably maybe another month or two before i started getting a pretty consistent flow of uh, leads coming in from Mm -hmm. youtube and then also, it kind of also depends on what you talk about, right? Sure. Um, a lot of people have a problem is it's like, oh, I'm an agency owner. I'm going to start YouTube for acquisition source. What is the first video every single one makes? Oh, day in the life of an agency owner. <laughs> it's like no one gives a shit about that. <laughs> no one does. Because it, it's uh, 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 the Whiffham frame. Are you familiar with that? No, no. Uh, I'm what, not. What's in it for me? Uh, mm-hmm. It's like that's what people come to your channel for. It's not about you. It's not about the day in your life. It's mm. what's in it for me as the viewer. And so if you're not speaking to the audience of like, hey, this is what you should be taking away from this. This is how you can apply it. Or this is the value you're going to get from it. Uh, I mean, it's cl- classic marketing too. It's like you never speak about really you in advertisement. It's always about them, right? Mm. And so uh, I think that's a trap that a lot of young YouTubers get mm-hmm. into of like, cool, let me show you all the cool stuff that I'm doing. It's like, no one cares. Like, what is the value you're going to bring to that viewer? Absolutely. And that's also like where a big part of it's like when you start making content in this space for YouTube, it's like every video needs to be specifically targeted to your ideal customer. So what do you do for your ideal customer? You know, for us, our main focus is taking brands from $100,000 a month to scaling them up to a million dollars a month net profit so we can collect a commission check off mm. of that. So Every piece of content I make on YouTube needs to be focused around that, demonstrating I have the ability and the strategies to be able to take someone to that level. So that way it may not get a lot of views, but if I make, if I post a video on YouTube that shows, here's how to go from $100,000 a month to a million dollars a month at your e-commerce store, maybe get 60 views. Mm -hmm. That's 60 people that's only watching it because they're at $100,000 a month and they want to go to a million dollars a month. Mm -hmm. That's 60 brands doing at least a million to $2 million a year in revenue. Yeah. Only one of them need to cl- or 10 of them need to click the calendar link and one of them need a book or, you know, maybe five of them book a call and you close one or two of them. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, and, and it's such a good point because we often think like views is going to correlate to our ability to close mm-hmm. deals. And it's like, well, if your views are coming from ideal buyers and it's like, cool, we got 500 views. Like, you know, I was looking through some of the videos kind of prepping for this podcast and, you know, some of them have a thousand, two thousand, which in the grand scheme of YouTube, it's like that's not a whole lot, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, but that's not the point. And the point is that 1,000 to 2,000 people that are your potential buyers are watching your content. And that's Mm -hmm. where the power kind of comes into it is that you're going after a specific market. It's very niche. It's very, um, it's content that is driving value for a very specific group of people that you're trying to work with. And I think that's something that a lot of people miss when they're starting out in like Mm -hmm. the content spaces. They think, oh, I'm going to go broad market. I just want to grow my viewership first, focusing down on a very Mm -hmm. niche group of people to go after. Yeah, and it's so key you said that right there because, you know, a lot of people are like, Nick, why don't you have a million subscribers? You know, why don't you have hundreds of thousands of views and stuff like that? And there is other people in the Facebook ads niche that do have a couple hundred thousand subscribers getting millions of views every month. But if you look at their content and you look at my content, Mm -hmm. they're posting stuff of, Here's how to run Facebook ads for $5 a day. Mm. Here's how to find winning products at $5 a day. If you look at my videos, it's here how to go from you know $30,000 a month, $100,000 a month to a million dollars per month. Mm-hmm. There's extremely less people at that scale, and there's going to be less people searching for my content. But the people that do click on it, they're going to convert at a higher quality and higher value. For sure. I think over the last 600 videos I've made in the last four years, I think I have five videos for beginners. Because they are not my target audience at all. Yeah. And I make that clear by only making content for my target mm-hmm. audience. Yeah. Uh, I learned this thing called uh, obvious and non-obvious content. Have mm-hmm. you ever heard of that before? Uh, no. Okay. But. So, uh, like, the obvious content side is 
more like broad channel so it's like what they would consider like repurposed content like it's mm. stuff that you learn you're, you're just repurposing. yeah like evergreen type yeah like right evergreen there. type content like people will always come back to it. it's very broad audience whereas a non-obvious content is more of the concept of we're taking our learnings and the things that from our experience and repurposing it into content that's kind of like net new um and this is something that we see all the time is like you can kind of tell like people who have taken content and like from someone else and then brought it into kind of like their own frame. Like that's what we consider like obvious mm. content, which is totally normal. Like people do it all the time. Like your Hermoses do it. I do it sometimes. Like that's curating content. Uh, but for like you, what I've kind of noticed in so a lot of your videos is like you're speaking from experience. You're not speaking from other people's experience, mm. right? And so that's why I think your content is going to kind of like one, stand the test of time because it's like, it's stuff that you're experiencing live in your accounts with your clients. And it's not something that someone else can just recreate. It's something that's coming from your experience only. Yeah. And that's something that I've, I've prided with myself literally ever since like my first video ever on the channel about Facebook ads is that literally everything's a case study. Mm. So anytime we have a new win in the agency, I'm documenting it. I'm making that a video. Um, yeah. There might be some evergreen content, like how to run Facebook ads in 2024, but I'm still documenting it in every video. Like I try to lead with a case study. So here's how we run Facebook ads in 2024. Here's an account we did exactly that same for. Here's what we do. Da, da, mm -hmm. da, da, and showing those examples right there. Um, people are also going to notice that confidence in the way you're speaking and everything like that. That's going to create a larger impact as well uh, for these higher quality deals that are coming in. They want to see people like that experts in the space of what they're talking about. They're going to see that versus just, you know, someone trying to articulate it who's never done that before. Mm. And that does play a big impact on the sales conversion rate from your content. Mm, for sure. Now, YouTube aside, you know, there's other lead gen channels. Are you currently mm -hmm. running any other lead gen channels for your agency or is it strictly YouTube where you're getting your deal flow from? Yeah, so it was YouTube strictly only for two, uh, 2019 all the way up to about 2023. And what, where did you get from just doing YouTube? Like, like how was the scale? Mm -hmm. like, like what revenue range did you get to? Uh, just YouTube alone. And, and again, too, like I'm still scaling with YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. So you, yeah. got, you also got to look at that like, a year ago, I was only at 15,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. um, year prior to that, I was probably only about 7,500 mm -hmm. you know, subscribers. Um, just with YouTube, I was able to scale to 50, 60K a month fairly quickly within a year, two years. Yeah. Right. So that was pretty good. Um, from there, I entered uh, Instagram uh, Reels, which mm -hmm. that's the new thing for this year. And then last year, I introduced Twitter. Mm. And I really like Twitter. It's a good, um, good place. Yeah, yeah. Twitter's a really good place because I've been kind of following the Hermosi uh, method for that right mm -hmm. there, which is literally just anytime you get a tweet idea, tweet it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that way it's like every week I'm making, you know, 25 to 30 tweets. I don't have a schedule at all for Twitter. It's I get an idea, I tweet it. Get an yeah. idea and tweet it. Some days I have no ideas. I don't tweet anything. Some days I have load ideas <laughs> and I just tweet everything <laughs> you um, just blasted it out yeah, there yeah and, and that's the thing and then I can see what's getting more engagement what's getting lower engagement that way when I film my content the next week mm. here's the tweets that popped off let me go recreate those as YouTube videos let me go recreate those as shorts yeah and then that's where I did I did Twitter all last year and I was able to go from I think 2,000 or a thousand followers to about 8,500 all last year yeah um, that's been a pretty good that's I would say uh, 30 to 40 percent of my referral source mm -hmm. so youtube 50 percent twitter about 30 to 40 percent and then instagram reels this year uh it's been my new thing so since january 1st i've been posting five reels every week wow um and that's just looking at twitter content looking at youtube content pulling that filming five reels launching them wow. um i used to pay my agency to create me those reels and I would republish them. And I just noticed they didn't really get much impact at all. So now I'm just manually filming them and being trying to as organic as possible. Okay. And that's actually been working a lot better okay. nice. for me. Um, and that's been about 10 to 20% of my referral source. But okay. other than that, I'm not running ads. Oh, yeah, to be fair, I actually just launched ads last week. Nice. <laughs> I'm finally diving in the ad space TBD. For, for the agency. So that, that's going to be something out for about a year from now to kind of see how that goes. Cool. Um, I did cold DMs and like cold outreach and stuff. Yeah. But that was like 2019 before YouTube took off. I'd say 2017 and 2019 before YouTube took off. Mm -hmm. I was doing cold DMs and outreach from my agency and I haven't touched it since then. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Do you think you ever go back? 
Oh, no. You don't um, think so? And and the reason why is that's that's the goal with the um the Facebook ad side is that I know you can land high quality well clients with the Facebook ad side. It's just what'll happen is when people get started, they try ads for acquisition source, but they don't have the financials to invest in ads. Mm -hmm. So they'll run ads for like a week and they're like, oh, I spent like 600 bucks. I didn't close any clients or I didn't land any sales calls. Let me turn it off because, you know, they don't have the investment part. I can afford to spend, you know, $3,000 a month now on ads at a complete loss and do it with the intentions of let me learn so yeah. I can improve that acquisition source because I do know like ads, that's the greatest way to scale things. Yep. You know, it's a lot easier just to scale up a budget versus, Hey, let's scale up our DM operations and stuff like that yeah. inside the agency. Yeah, for sure. And hopefully at some point we can have a conversation about outbound because man, it's uh, it, it can be a game changer and you can mm -hmm. reach those high level clients as well. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been running a strategy on LinkedIn and um, for my followers, you I've probably seen it on YouTube already, but um, we've been doing a, a LinkedIn DM strategy that has been working incredible because on LinkedIn, you can use Sales Navigator and you can target pretty mm -hmm. much any audience that you want. So like if you're going for CEOs, if you're looking for vice president of mm -hmm. marketing for really large companies, great, we can segment specifically by that and we can send outbounds to these guys. And then for us, like we run like in tandem organic with outbound. Mm -hmm. And so if we connect with someone and that's what's great about LinkedIn is it's a follow for follow essentially. So mm -hmm. it's like, it's not like Instagram where it's like you follow someone and then they have to follow you back to see yeah. your content. Like LinkedIn is follow for follow. So we connect with someone and then we're posting content and then we send them a DM. So hopefully we kind of build some leadership positioning mm -hmm. with the organic content and then we can send them outbound to be able to kind of start the conversation and for them to get interested in what we're doing. And so I'll change that. I'll that's, that's, that's pretty cool, man. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll change your mind about a couple of our clients. Like uh, one of our clients landed Hexclad uh, from an outbound wow. message. Nice. Yeah. So those are the types of brands I know you're you're shopping for. I'm. I I think I could convince you so to, to start running some outbound. So I do have a process similar to that with LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Um, not with the content side on LinkedIn, but I, I do have a cons a similar strategy to that. That I I did deploy for a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, the, the problem was, was that I started to um, invest into the LinkedIn strategy. I want to say it was last year between May and August mm -hmm. and hired a team to start to utilize and everything like that. But the problem was the, is the people I was hiring, they weren't mm. thinking for themselves, mm. um, which is a, you know, op, as an ops guy, you know, that, yeah. that right there. For sure. So, and I was so focused with the organic and the client results that I could never give it my full attention. So I ended up just calling the whole project. I was sure. like, there's no point in me continuing to do this if I know I can't give it my full effort. Uh, but I did build out a whole, you know, LinkedIn strategy and stuff yeah. like that. So well, I mean, it's such a good, good point to like also talk about is if you're going to half ass, you know, mm -hmm. five different lead gen strategies, they're probably not going to work very well. So it's Absolutely. Like you really have to dedicate to one and then expand. And that's something that like we even found with Tyler, um, you know, like organic strategy in general. It's like, dude, like we were half-assing YouTube and we weren't getting any traction with it. Well, we started going all in on YouTube this year and we cut, like I cut Twitter out for the time being. And we are like our two main focuses are mm -hmm. YouTube and LinkedIn right now. I don't post a whole lot on Instagram reels anymore because we were doing it half-assed. And so for mm -hmm. me, it was like, cool, we're going to pick two lanes. I feel confident we can do LinkedIn very well. I'm confident we can do YouTube very well. And that's going to be our organic channels that we're just going to pump right now. And ever since then, the channel has been growing. Not anything spectacular quite yet. We're getting there, though. I mean, like the, the metrics keep increasing every single month. Uh, and then LinkedIn, uh, the past 60 days, I've gotten 2,500 new followers on, wow. on that's LinkedIn. Wow, amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's been that's a game really changer. Good. For sure. So uh, we're going to continue to push on those strategies until we have like a really dialed system, get it a little bit more automated, and then we'll go back to the other ones. But that's such a good point you brought up of like, you have to be great at one, mm -hmm. otherwise it's going to fall flat. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, similar if anything, even like for like e-com brands trying to grow their business, anyone trying to grow their business, it's like focus on one acquisition source before you try to master all of them because then it's just like, hey, I'm investing a ton of money in all these sources and I don't have time to master one and mm -hmm. you just, you get nowhere. And I think it's actually, it's great to kind of pivot on that in terms of um, what I was mentioning earlier about how we just added Instagram Reels this year because last year I was doing Instagram Reels, but it was just my YouTube team trying to find a good little spot in every video. Mm -hmm. And they would, I was just repurposing on Instagram and I was getting like five, 10 likes on it, nothing crazy on yep. it. And then like now it's like, 
I've been posting a lot of Instagram reels and, you know, I'm actually putting intention behind it yeah. to make it good. Well, they're like individual pieces versus, Correct. versus uh, what you're taking from a long form mm-hmm. video and repurposing. Yeah. Yeah. And we've been getting, you know, I mean, I would say probably averaging about 50 to 60 likes per one, a lot more shares and everything like that. And then since I posted ads about a week ago, I started running ads. And uh, what I'm getting now for like the Instagram side is I'm getting a lot more higher people that I normally wouldn't reach mm-hmm. with my Instagram reels. So I just start to follow me and they'll tell you like start following you from your ad. And um, all of my Instagram reel content now is kind of like a, uh, you know, retargeting pool yeah. in a way, you know, because now they're like, hey, they follow me from an ad, which is, again, it's not even the objective, but it's just a byproduct of yeah. running ads as you get more followers. And um, now they're seeing all my organic content. And they're more engaged and stuff like that. So now it's like they're entering my matrix. And yeah. then now they're getting hit with that content, which is, you know, slowly continuing to sell them. Just constant nurturing. Correct. Yeah, yeah. it's so good. <laughs> Have you dabbled in like email newsletters at all? Like, yeah, yeah. like email I, lists and stuff? I do stuff? email lists every week. Okay, yeah. cool. I've been cool. doing email lists now. Oh, I started doing email lists in October. Um, because I get, uh, two, you know, there's two sources of our two main offers from my agency. Mm-hmm. There is me coming in and running all of your ads. And then there's me consulting you with your ads. So, um, those are two different products. And, um, I, I think I have like a little over like a thousand people that's applied for my consulting program. Mm-hmm. And then I have a couple hundred, you know, leads that just came in for like the agency side. Um, and I'll just email them every week. Um, do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I keep it extremely simple. Yeah. Every time I post a YouTube video, I send them an email and let them mm. know when the new YouTube video drops. Nice. And that gives them all the value they need. And that's that, that converts really well for me. Yeah. When you're matching up that cadence between newsletter and YouTube video, do you guys, like, is it, hey, we post every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so we know exactly what's going on when, and so we can align our newsletter with it at the same yep. time? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I'll uh, usually, and I'm, I'm still writing the newsletter, so I'm not, I'm not outsourcing or anything like that. And then what I'll do is, is just, hey, upload a new video Monday at 10 a.m. Then what I'll do is I'll just go and type up that newsletter really quick. And it's usually like 10, 15 lines and just drives a lot of curiosity and make mm-hmm. them want to click that video to, to you know, satisfy that desire that I kind of hit on yep. in that email. And it um, works really well. And it's yeah. just a great, again, follow-up of content right there, especially since I'm sending it out to leads in the agency that are doing a couple hundred thousand dollars a month in revenue. And it's like, boom, here's how we did, you know, $2.5 million in ad spend for this client over Mm -hmm. this period of time right there. Um, And I'm just constantly talking about those baller case studies, which continues to sell them and follow up with them. Uh, How are you getting people into your newsletter? When they apply. When they apply to those two offers, those two offers are on every single tweet I post and on every single YouTube video. Okay. So that's where all the traffic comes through. They um, apply to work with my agency or they apply for my consulting Mm. program. Okay. And then that builds up that newsletter. Yeah. Uh, so I just do an application um, mm-hmm. as like my lead magnet, and uh, it's worked really well. Oh, nice. Uh, have you ever dabbled like any like low ticket type type uh, like offers or funnels, anything mm-hmm. like that, or like free freebies that you can push people into your newsletter from? I one of them, yes, uh, for about a week. Okay. Uh, not even <laughs> not even long period of time where I, um, I just did a free training, enter your information below, access this free training right yep. there. Um, the problem I had was that it was more of just like out of curiosity to see if I could launch it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't put my full effort and attention behind mm-hmm. it. So I didn't make it good. Yeah. Um, and haven't had, really had a reason to need to yet. Yeah. So that's the only reason why I haven't yet. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. That's, that's something that we've, we implemented on really early. Cause like we knew we wanted to build a good email list and a large email list. And so we just started putting out like free trainings, free resources for, for agency owners, collecting num- uh, phone numbers, emails. Eventually we got a setting team to like call all these people, mm-hmm. uh, try to either get them on something low ticket or, you know, hey, a few of them come through and it's like, sweet, like they're very viable for a high ticket offer. Uh, and like, those are the ones that, that we send through like a, to a further discovery call. But, um, that's, I mean, it's a good strategy if you're just like trying to grow that email list quickly. Um, oh, like having some sort of like front end offer free or like seven dollars, something like that. You can just push tons of emails through uh, and then just start nurturing that because eventually, you know, even like the small guys, because it, it does bring a lot of um, underqualified mm-hmm. leads into the ecosystem. But it's like some of those guys are going to break through with the information that you give them and hopefully put themselves in a position. And like, that's, that's how we've always looked at lead gen is long-term nurture, long-term mm-hmm. nurture. Hopefully uh, an agency or a brand can build themselves into a position to work with us. And if we're the ones that gave them the information to get there, 
mm-hmm. who are they going to trust to run their ads? Absolutely. And great point right there. It's because we went through that same phase as well. And, you know, before I did my consulting program, I was all in just on that one, which is my agency offer. Um, side note for everyone watching this. If you don't already have a solid acquisition source for your agency, do not start going into low ticket offers because <laughs> the low ticket offers are, like you said, a long term play. Yeah. And when you're in that back against the wall and you put money on the table this month, yep. they are not <laughs> something no. you need to focus on as well. Definitely not. So for us, that's when I made my consulting program. I uh, launched that November of 2022. Mm-hmm. So it's been a little over a year now I've launched that. We were getting a ton of people coming into the agency, applying to work with the agency. Um, and they just simply weren't making enough money for us to come in and help them scale. So, and I had no like other programs to put them in. So it was just kind of like, cool, you know, hit yeah. me up in a few months. Yeah. Um, well, people pay for strategy all the time. The biggest, the mm-hmm. biggest brands in the world pay for strategy. Your apples, Coca-Cola, they, mm-hmm. they will pay for strategies and new ideas just to run. And so uh, that's such a good point. Like, Hey, you know, it's not always just like the done for you implementation. Mm-hmm. Like some people want the, give me the, give me the guideline, give me the mm-hmm. rules. Let me talk to you, see how you're doing this. And then eventually they'll, they can get to a point where they can work with you and still collect revenue on some of those. Unqualified. Absolutely. Yeah. A great way to make your break even on your acquisition costs for your agency is have those down ticket, low ticket products that break even on that. So that way, like your agency acquisition is almost fully just mm-hmm. evergreen profitable. Yeah. Self liquidating. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. But when we launched that consulting program, that was huge for us because we got to see a lot of brands that came into it. Um, that were doing maybe ten thousand dollars a month. Now doing multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in revenue. Mm. Um, I know I have four students right now that's at the million dollar month mark. Wow, in the that's program. incredible. Yeah, and they came in. They were spending hundred, two hundred dollars a day with Facebook ads. So Holy cow. again, unicorn students, top one sure. percent. Yeah. Not everyone's doing that, but you know, a lot of them have been able to come in, apply, scale really hard, and uh, we've had a multiple now. I think probably about six or seven of them over the last year that have scaled up really quick in the consulting program. Mm-hmm. Hey, Nick, I need you to work with me, you know? And then it's like, they're coming to me now after applying strategies that I showed them. It helped them make a lot of money. That's the easiest close ever. That's oh. literally like yeah. not even a sales call, just send over contract invoice, <laughs> sign me up. And yeah. like, if you don't respond to it within an hour, they're like hitting you up until you do yeah. <laughs> type of thing. They're chasing you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the most ideal. Uh, ideal way to get leads like we always yeah. like referrals because they always come in super warm they're trusted mm-hmm. and like that's better than a referral that's like the hottest Absolutely. that's a uh, piping hot lead that you're bringing into the ecosystem so uh cool well he- here's kind of where i want to direct our conversation next is um i think a lot of people will look at the success that you've had uh and don't understand like the timeline mm-hmm. of like what it's actually taken like the grit and the bearing down um can you like share some insights of like, Hey, if someone's like starting in the agency space or maybe they're getting their footing at like the 20 to 50 K per month and they're, you know, trying to expand from there at that point in your agency, if you go back and you're like, all right, like we just went back to 50 K, what are you mm-hmm. focusing most on right now? It depends. Yeah. Just like everything. Mm-hmm. What, what's the problem of why you fell back to 50 K? Mm-hmm. Is it client retention? Is it client acquisition? You know, I, I find that a lot of agencies, they either can't acquire clients and can keep clients or they can keep clients, but they cannot acquire clients. Mm. Um, 95% of the time is they can acquire clients, but they can't keep clients. <laughs> 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 so the first thing is just dialing in where, where that problem lies in the business. Yep. Um, usually in the beginning phase, probably that zero to 10 came up is more of an acquisition problem. You're mm. just simply not doing enough volume. But I find once you go up to like that 50, 60 K a month mark and you're really trying to scale to that 100 K a month mark, um, easiest things for me was charge more. Mm. Right, instead of charging 5 K a month, charge 10 K a month. Mm. Stop selling features in that perspective right there and all these deliverables we can do and start focusing more on transformations inside of your business. So for me, a lot of the times was just, hey, yeah, I can run your Facebook ads for your e-com brand. Um, you know, here's a, here's a few case studies. Mm-hmm. And that was it. So I was just kind of appealing to anyone with an e-com brand. Now for us, and this actually improved our conversion rate, was that we're starting to focus now only on e-com brands that are at 100,000, 100 to 250K a month in revenue. And we want to scale them to $1 million a month net profit. Mm-hmm. We've helped about four brands do that now. Wow. So that's our whole goal. That's the only person we want to cater to. And ever since we changed all of our sales pages to reflect that, all of our scripts and everything to reflect mm-hmm. that, Guess what? We started acquiring at a higher magnitude. I mean, that exact client. There you go. 
And it also, for me, my perspective, a client that's already doing 100, 250K a month in revenue is significantly easier to work with than a client that's zero dollars a month for or sure. 10K a month in revenue. Yeah. They already have a proven market, they have a proven product. Now it's just simply how do we ramp that up fast? Mm -hmm. That's our only goal. So for us, charging more was a big one, focusing more on the transformation that allowed us to get better clients for the agency right there. Um, and then obviously the system size, the operation size, mm -hmm. where are we lacking at? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the, the key people we need to bring into the business? You know, for me, it's like uh, I recently just had to hire some copywriters and stuff like that. I actually had to hire one, had to let one go as well because they're just simply were not providing the, um, you know, the quality of work I sure. needed and everything like that. So like that was something right there that was holding back my client retention because we had one copywriter that literally lost four clients. Mm. So I was like, dude, that was like, you know, $120,000. Uh, per client per year. So it's about $480,000 when you look at it like that, that yeah. one copywriter lost in, in terms of business revenue for us. So it's like, maybe it's, you have the wrong team members, mm. you know, where do you, you it's, it's f figuring out where those problems are at in your business and fixing the leaky bucket yeah. to where you can scale faster. to that hundred K 200 K 300 K a month mark at the agency. Yeah. And I guess like more future pacing, you know, it's like you guys have your own bottlenecks currently. Mm -hmm. Like, yep. what are you guys fixing in the agency right now? Where is your big focus going into, you know, now Q2 of this year? It's a great, great question. So for us, we have acquisition dialed in. Um, right now, my biggest weakness is I don't have enough people on my team that, that are me or mm -hmm. better than me when it comes down to marketing right now. So right now, that's what I'm focusing in and dialing in on all of the key positions is that you need to be better than me. Mm. Um, I don't want people that are below me. I need to be hiring people that are above me. And I think that's a big mistake I made in terms of as I was growing the agency, I didn't have a lot of funds. Mm. So when you're hiring talent in the beginning, you're either hiring people that know exactly what they do, but you don't have the money because it's still beginning stages. Yep. So then it's like you still take on all the important roles, but you give them more just like, mediocre roles yeah, like that the just admin kinda, type yeah stuff. yeah but now it's like now that we're trying to scale up to that next level to that one million dollar from off mark then i need everyone way better than me yeah because right now i'm my agency's biggest bottleneck yeah yeah for sure what are you doing internally right now is it like trainings is it uh, are you documenting your playbooks mm. um like what are you doing to get your team or is it simply just hey we're just going to start hiring the savages in the marketplace and we're like we're gonna go find these people and they're gonna come in they're already gonna be better than me that's a really good question right there so a couple different things it's, it's a mixture of everything to be honest mm -hmm. it's a little bit more trainings of okay number one first identifying all of our biggest case studies and our speed of case studies what are the exact steps we took mm -hmm. which we already have a general idea but when you start to apply that to creative strategy, that's where a lot of people, it's because it's a lot more, it's creative. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, yeah. it's, it's hard to systemize creative. So how do you systemize that process of the exact winning creative for every account? And how do we find that winning creative as fast as possible? Mm. So that's a big thing that we're reworking right now inside of our agency. So that way we can speed up that process to resolve. Because right now it's like, on average, we're scaling brands in like 45 to 60 days. And it's like, I want to be scaling brands in the first week. Yeah. Because if you can make a client money in the first week, like that's going to position you in a way that they're going to stay with you for a lifetime. Yeah. I know we had a client that um, we made them like a million dollars in a month relatively quick. And they were doing only a hundred thousand dollars a month at the time. And we helped them do a million, in like literally six days of working together. And that client's within us been for, been with us for a few years. Cause he looks at us like, Oh shit. You know, look what they've been able to achieve. Yeah. So right now it's how do we speed up that process to resolve our agency? Where are we, I know we're doing all the right actions, but how do we cut the fat from some of those mm -hmm. other actions? Yeah. How do we focus on the most important things right from the beginning? Mm -hmm. so that's one thing right there. Then my next thing is as I do these trainings and systemizations is understanding, okay, hey, is it a talent issue or is it a system issue right there? Because mm -hmm. sometimes you have actually have amazing talent on your team, but you just have the wrong systems in place. Yeah. But then the other times you can do all the training, you can do all the systemization, everything like that, but it's just the person. The person doesn't want it. You know, you want people in your team that want it more than you. That's the type of people you want in your team. And if they simply just do not care, you need to get those people off as fast as possible. Yeah, yeah, it's like the, uh, I've always found as we were scanning companies, like people will come with you or they'll mm -hmm. be left behind. And it's like a lot of times the staff that we started with aren't necessarily the people that, the ones that got us from here aren't the next, uh, the ones that necessarily get us to the next point in our business and it's like mm -hmm. that's really tough because like that founding team 
sometimes is like like hey we have connections we have ties together mm-hmm. there's a relationship there but um you have to understand like some people aren't going to continue that journey with you because they just one might not have what it takes they might not want mm-hmm. to do what it takes to get to that next level and it's like for where you're going a million dollar per month business i mean you're gonna need extremely good people people that can outsmart you and and mm-hmm. run a business just as effectively as you can market better than you can be more creative than you like that's what it takes to get to that next level and uh, that's even you know as you're saying it's like that's what we focus on currently mm-hmm. is like one how do we up level our people because like we're we're not uh, at multi six quite yet um mm-hmm. but it's like we're we're pushing towards it currently so it's like cool we have to up level the team because like dude i don't want to cut anyone from my team ever that that's not a good feeling so it's like we're starting a lot of those practices early of like how are we up leveling this team to be the team that's going to be the 200k team Mm -hmm. and the 300k team the million dollar a month team because that that action has to start now it can't be when we're at 200k and we're like oh shoot the people that we have on our team are not 200k 300k people Mm -hmm. you know so it's like we got to take them on that journey with us so it's like uh, i think the biggest misconception that i see in the agency space in leadership in general is people tend to hire people in and start to delegate. And they feel as if they can step out of leadership and essentially say, cool, I brought on a team, <laughs> I'm good to go. And this is where we see like a lot of the churn happen and a lot of the the bottlenecks start to happen mm-hmm. is because, well, no, 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 just because you delegated does not mean you get to step away from leadership. If anything, you need to step further into leadership, continue mm-hmm. the de- development, continue to bring your team along you with the ride, give them the homework assignments that are going to create them to be the, uh, the people that are going to support the next level of the business. So if you want to keep those people around, you have to bring them along with you on the journey. I love that. Yeah, I know that's something recently, I would say in October, November, I appointed a particular team member in that leadership position of, of keeping the team accountable, keeping the team in the trainings and stuff like that. And that's been a huge help right there to where I can still kind of focus on development in the team, but I can look at that longer term picture mm-hmm. where that particular person is keeping everyone accountable in the short term to complete the trainings, to improve and continue to measure their performance and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So that way, because it's, I love doing that stuff, but I'm just not consistent with those things because those are not the t- types of things I'm passionate about. Sure. So I instead of hey, me having that issue and me force myself to hate those things, I just systemize that aspect right there and put a particular person in that role. Um, so that way it's like, Hey, here's the team training that I want implemented this week. He goes, make sure all of those are taken care of. He reports back the performance of each team member. Then I can go in further to have those separate conversations with those team members about their performance. Mm. Um, so that way I don't have to spend a lot of time myself doing that. Yeah. So, and that's, that's been a huge key for me as well over the last couple months. I love it, dude. I love it. Cool. Uh, I want to wrap up here soon because attention spans for people <laughs> watching long form YouTube is always brutal. But uh, I always like to kind of end with like a little bit of a random question, like off the cuff. Uh, I've seen so many people do like morning routines and mm-hmm. things like that. Uh, I'm just curious because like, dude, you're a, you're a high level entrepreneur in my opinion and you seem always super dialed in. What's well, mm-hmm. kind of like your juice getting ready for the morning? Like what does that morning routine look like? Give me the landscape of Nick Terrio. <laughs> <laughs> in the morning that's a really good question especially too i just got a new puppy so um <laughs> always my, tough my whole morning routine has been pretty much thrown out the window because <laughs> now it's like dealing with that puppy in the morning um you know I, i've tried so many morning routines bro I, I've, I've tried the cold showers i've tried the wake up go run five miles i've tried the wake up and go meditate while you're half asleep and then you end up just falling back to sleep. <laughs> um, I, I've tried literally everything. I, I remember at one point, like I would wake up at like 5 a.m. I'd start my morning routine and I'd be done with my morning routine at like 8 a.m. Then I would start work for the day. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, what the fuck am I wasting my time on? So yeah. um, lately it's been wake up. Um, this, this is also to, I think, what's been like a big key of my consistency over the last month or two is that um, I found a consistent bedtime that I can go to bed at during the weekends and the weekdays. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm 27, still single. I'm not going to bed at 8 o'clock on a Saturday night, yeah. you know? Yeah. So for me, it's like, all right, cool, 12 o'clock at night. I can go to bed 12 o'clock at night, Monday through Friday, and Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. And then I found a consistent wake-up time, 8 o'clock every morning. Mm-hmm. Um, I find that's been huge for me because nice. now it got to my circadian rhythm locked in mm. because a lot of people oh i want to start waking up at 5 a.m every day 
cool, go for it. But then Saturday and Sunday, they stay up till 2, 3 a.m. Mm. They sleep till 11 o'clock. And then Monday, they have to wake up at 5 a.m. And it's just like, boom, they're yeah. not locked in at all. Shell they're not shock. dialed in or anything like that. So find a time that works for you. Don't like 5 a.m. means nothing mm -hmm. if you can't stay consistent with it. Mm -hmm. So for me, 8 a.m., I can stay consistent with it. For me, after that, um, you know, my schedule completely open till 1 p.m. 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. is when I do all my calls Monday nice. through Friday. So I never do calls in the morning. I cannot stand them. It interrupts that kind of critical thinking time. Mm -hmm. um, some days I'll go to the gym in the morning after I wake up. Some days I'll go to the gym in the afternoon after calls. Just kind of depends on the day and if I have anything going on that night. Mm -hmm. um, first thing I do is just my money-making task. What makes me the most money? I only have two things that make me money, and I only focus on those every day. Those two things are content, posting content online, gets me referrals, gets me clients, and all that. That's my highest paid, like, basically thing I can do for my um, myself. Second thing is creating ads for clients. So all of our clients are on profit shares inside of the agency. Mm -hmm. So if I can get them a new ad angle, like, for example, one of my students in my consulting program literally just found a new ad angle that took him from $600 a day in spend to $1,200 a day in ad spend, mm. doubling his e-com business, business with just literally one ad. Yeah. So I go look at all of our accounts, look for more of the higher level things. What are the angles we're not focusing on and stuff that can help our clients make a lot more money, send those notes over to my team. And that's it. That's yep. done. So I always start my day off. What's going to make me the most money. Those are my two actions right there. Um, outside of that, I'll do anything else I want <laughs> yeah. pretty much till that one o'clock hits. Then I'll start my calls for the day till four and that's it. That's nice. my work day. Oh, I love that. I, I don't want to load my day with a lot of things. I want to only focus on one or two things throughout the day that's going to make me the most money. Mm. I find a lot of people, even me myself, um, I used to try to fill my day with all kinds of stuff so I could felt busy all day. And what happened, what ends up happening is you just feel overworked, feel burnt out, and you don't see that those results as best as you want. But it's like, what if you only focused on the things that make you the most money? What is going to happen to you in your business? Yeah. And everything else, delegate, hire people out. And that way you can only focus on the one or two things. Yeah. And that's been a huge key for me. Oh, it's huge, man. Um, out of curiosity, uh, I know you're a studier. Mm -hmm. when, like, when do you do your study? Usually after I finish those two actions, uh -huh. if I have some time left throughout the day, I'll do some studying. Okay. Um, at this level... What I would say now, it's less reading books. Mm -hmm. It's more so, who do I need to pay to? Who do I need to talk to? Mm -hmm. So if it's like, you know, I want to get better at copywriting. I'm not going to go read a bunch of copywriting books. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go hire a copywriter that's been making a lot of money in this space and then figure out, hey, what are the mm -hmm. one or two actions that I need to start focusing on? Mm -hmm. So it's more so, who do I need to pay for that? I still like to read books. Don't get me yeah. wrong. Um, but uh, usually I'll do my study and kind of after that, I'll spend some time. Um, I know over the last month, I've been kind of just going back to the basics to see what have I overlooked in the last year or two yeah. and how can I go rework those and like literally something simple as like hooks for ads. That's literally what I've been studying over the last week of different ways to improve the hooks we've been making for our clients. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'll spend an hour or so around that, uh, usually after my money making task in the morning. Nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm a huge book nerd. I just enjoy reading mm -hmm. in, in general. So it's like, that's where I spend like the first part of my my morning because it's un uninterrupted. I can get mm -hmm. like really zoned in on it. Uh, and then I'm very similar. I call them impact items. Um, yeah. It's like then I move directly into those and then it's on an inter interrupted time. And then we have a couple meetings in the morning, but I, I like the the afternoon times. Bro, right? I love it. I, I, I did that from a perspective of biology mm -hmm. because your brain has the most energy in the morning especially if you have a nice circadian rhythm dialed in with your mm -hmm. sleep schedule and wake-up schedule, your brain's dialed in, in the morning. Mm. Why would I waste that time and energy on calls? Yeah. Like, calls do not make me money at all. Even if it's a sales call, it doesn't make me money at all um, because I make my money when I get these sales calls mm. on the calendar. So I want to get all my high money-making actions done at the beginning of the day because that's where I have the most energy, the most time. The rest of the day, I can sit in calls. I don't need that much energy. I don't need that much brain power. Then I can jump into those calls and go through all that. And um, then after that, all right, cool. Now I can go hit the gym because the gym requires no brain power at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was I, I, I used to work out in the morning, mm -hmm. but then I pushed it all towards uh, the end of the day. I do like yeah. 4.30, 5.30 yeah, type, that's, that's fun type time workouts, for me. man. Because yeah. it's like I love going to the gym. And it's like it doesn't – it's not hard for me to like get myself mm -hmm. to the gym. Um, but like 
yeah, like sometimes my energy kind of sucks going into it, but uh, I've, I always find that like I can at least get myself there and, and put in put in some good effort. Yeah, and, and like I know for me, it's like I was getting up at like 5 a.m. <clears throat> even after eight hours of sleep, I was getting up at 5 a.m. and going to the gym, doing a nice, really good workout, coming back, showering, and getting to work. And I'm just like dead. Like I'm just tired yeah. after my work. I don't know who like I, I <laughs> I've never got had more energy for the day after working out. I always get tired after working out. I, I, I don't, I guess just I push myself to, I don't know, yeah. but like I always get tired after working out. So it's like, I want to save that for the end of the day. Cause I don't want to get tired before I go do the things that are to make me money. Right. You know, unless I'm trying to like prioritize becoming a bodybuilder or something like yeah. that, which I'm not. Yeah. So, you know, that's also where your priorities come in play. Whatever you're going to prioritize, you're going to do at the beginning of the day. And that's going to be the easiest thing to also stay consistent mm. over a long term period of time. Yeah, for sure. Well, dude, I appreciate you coming on, man. This is this has been fun. I was like, at any time you come in town, man, we got to shoot a podcast because <laughs> it's always good takeaways and it's always fun to see your growth. I think last time that we uh, had you down uh, in Nashville was like you were at, I think you were at 15k followers on YouTube. So it's yeah, cool to see. Yeah, that. I, was, I was about 70k in revenue at that time. That's so crazy, yeah. man. Such so. a such a blow up, man. I love it. So congrats on the success so far, Thank man. You, man. Excited to continue to watch your journey because uh, I mean, it gets me pumped up. It motivates a lot of people <laughs> in our circle too. So keep at it, man. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. I really glad, uh, really enjoyed, you know, you having me on, man. Yeah, for sure. It's good. All right, crew. Well, we will we'll see you guys on the next little agency therapy. Thank you. Don't forget, uh, click the like button, subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell if you want to know when these are dropping. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.